Good evening. Oh, I gotta get my. Without this, the PowerPoint's worthless, isn't it? Great to be back with everybody this evening, and uh, we're gonna continue in the series. This is a pretty fundamental series. We're talking about how do we come to a point where we make a decision as to being righteous, living a godly life in a particular set of circumstances, making a decision as to whether we should do this or should do that or whether we should not do this or not do that, making a choice here or making a choice there, when it's not specifically specified in Scripture. And so what this is is really basically a kind of, of formula of principles, general principles that God has laid out for us in the scriptures to help us to make the decisions in those kinds of situations. Now, we've talked about how feelings is not really a good method to choose because feelings can be deceptive. And we've all felt good about a particular decision or circumstance, and so we decide we're going to do this, but it feels right, and then we found out we made a mistake. Is you ever, were you ever driving someplace and you, you came to kind of a crossroads and maybe you weren't looking at GPS or maybe you didn't have GPS, maybe that was the days before GPS, and which way should I go here? And, and so it this feels right. And you turned there and you went down that way and then after maybe a mile or two or 10, you realized I'm going the wrong way. So you had to turn around and go back. I've made that mistake. Probably most of us have made similar kinds of mistakes. So I've entitled this, this study, A Guide to Help Decide. How we can come to, I think, righteous decisions reasonable decisions when the scriptures do not lay out specifically do this or don't do this. So last week we talked about the first, the first uh, general principle that I believe we see in scripture and that is whatever it is that we're contemplating, can I do this in the name of the Lord? Because in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 we're told Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And so we talked about how as Christians, we wear the name of Christ, Christ ones, Christian. And so whatever we're doing, whatever we're going to decide to do, we're going to wear that name because we're Christians. Well, can I do this in the name of the Lord? Can I wear the Lord's name rightly and faithfully and, and take part in whatever this is I'm contemplating. Maybe it's a life decision. Maybe it's whether I should go to this party or not or whether I should take part in this activity or not or whether I should hang with this particular group or not, whether I should make this decision on this particular job or not. So I, felt, I knew a fellow one time many years ago and he was out of a job. He'd been out of a job for quite some time. And then he was, he was offered a position with a beer distributor. What decision should he make? He needed a job. But should a Christian be doing that? Another fella within my family, he was perhaps offered a job working in a casino as somebody who would run the machines, make sure they were in proper working order. Well, might have been a good paying job, might have been a secure position, but should a Christian be involved in that kind of atmosphere? And so you see what I'm talking about. Again, should a husband and wife, if they're having, if they're having difficulties in their marriage relationship, they're having trouble getting along and it's been that way for a while, should one decide to divorce the other? Or should one, if they become attracted to another person, leave this one and go to that one? 
Those particular questions are answered in Scripture pretty much straightforwardly. But now the others, we left wondering, okay, what would be the right thing to do in this particular set of circumstances? So can you do this in the name of the Lord? That was the first general principle that I think we can pull from Scripture to help, help us make the right decision. The second one is very similar to it, but it is unique in and of itself. Okay? Can I do this to the glory of God? How do we decide? How do we decide? Well, Matthew 15 and verse 19 again, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, for adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. So we have to be careful about just saying, well, let your heart be your guide. What do you feel like in your heart? Or what, is your, what do your feelings tell you? We need to be careful. We need to be more objective than that because feelings are subjective and we know that we uh, have made mistakes probably a number of times just based upon feelings. So, can I do this to the glory of God? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to bottom line. And I, I had a friend of mine, preacher friend of mine, and I was a little bit surprised. Many, many years ago, he said, he, he, got, he got this across to me and, and it made sense. As Christians, we should bottom line, basic mission of our lives as Christians should be to glorify God. Whatever we do, however we live, that should be our bottom line mission in life, glorify God. Now, there are all kinds of, of particular directions that God's word instructs us to take as to serving him in active ways, but all of that should be conditioned upon, I want to live my life to God's glory. And that should be a basic fundamental prayer of ours on a regular basis. God, please guide me to live to your glory. And I, you know, I try to be careful when, when I get people praising me for a lesson or for something that I've taught or whatever, I, I, I really appreciate that. We all like to get patted on the back. But I try to keep in my mind these are the, my ability or my opportunities, my means to be able to do those things, they're blessings from God, and I want to give him the glory. I don't want to get sucked into that kind of mindset where I'm doing this all on my own. It's all by my ability, all by my capabilities, my strength, and so on. I want to remember it's God who has given me the blessings, and I want to do it to his glory. So, we bear a unique identity, and we should live with a unique focus in life. In Colossians chapter 3, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 31, it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so, a whole lot of people, they are all caught up in self-glory, self-aggrandizement. They're really seeking praise and they'll point out to people, yeah, I, I did this and I did that and I did, and it's not the idea of, of, you know, kind of communicating experience to be able to give some good advice to these individuals, but it's just the idea, look at what I've done, self-glorification. But bottom line again, we need to have the mindset, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Because again, whatever abilities, opportunities that are good, godly opportunities that we have been afforded, they're blessings from God, and we need to give him the glory. Now, that doesn't mean we should not reap some benefits that would be natural on the basis of those particular achievements, but to just keep pointing to ourselves for see how good I am, see how, good, how, how, how great I've done, and so on, that is something that we need to push out of our minds because... Those can be, that can be an avenue through which the devil can work and lead us to a mindset that is ungodly and that is counter to what the scriptures teach us. So Colossians 3 and verse 17, whatever you do, 
do it, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when you couple that with 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Very, very similar. But remember this, and this is something that, that I've, I've really kind of semi-wrestled with a great deal, many, many times in my, my preaching life. Remember that when Jesus was on this earth, he continually gave God the glory. Now here's God the Son. Here's the one who did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, but allowed himself to be made a little lower than the angels in taking human form, come to this earth and be the, the Savior. But he, he was in heaven, God the Son. But while he was here on that mission on this earth, he continually gave God the glory, glorified God. Well, so we bear a unique, a unique identity and we should live with a unique focus. I need to live in such a way that God will be pleased and that through my life, the way I live, God will be glorified. When faith, our faithful lifestyle should shine bright like a light, like a, a beam of light before the world around us and thereby glorify God. Look at what Jesus wrote in, in verse 23 of Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. We should not be about in our mindset and the focus of our life primarily to please people around us. Now, that, that can be a good focus, but it would be like a secondary focus because primary focus should be, I want to please the Lord. I want to please God. When we look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, in the Sermon on the Mount toward the beginning of that particular immediate context of Scripture, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. But the verse does not stop there and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, they're going to see your good works, but they're going to recognize you're doing this to God's glory. You're doing this in service to God. You're doing this in commitment and obedience to God. And God ultimately would be the recipient of that glory. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked generation. <laughs> crooked and perverse generation. And boy, we live in that right now, don't we? Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So I need to be focused. I need to have that mindset, kind of that, that governing basic mindset that is always there, primary in my, in my thoughts and my focus in life. I want to live to God's glory. I want to serve God. Now, I want to get to heaven, but... I can't get there on my own. And I need to be thankful for what God has done. And we continually in our prayers here at Sunny Slope, in our worship services, Bible classes, we thank God for loving us so much. And I appreciate those men who lead those prayers mentioning that so repeatedly. Thank you, God, for loving us so much that you sent your son to this earth to die on the cross for us. Now, that's giving God glory, giving God glory. We can't save ourselves. We cannot forgive ourselves. We have to come to God for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 11, Peter says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that would be the unbelievers, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, are we going to have critics living our lives as faithful Christians? You bet. Sometimes they'll be open critics. They'll, they'll make fun of us, criticize us right before our faces. 
Sometimes they'll be talking about us behind our backs. Sometimes they may try to just kind of keep it to themselves, not say anything, but there may be look or body language that tells us, you know, they, they don't respect how we're trying to live our lives or the decisions we're trying to make or the basis on which we try to make those decisions. But even in that case, even when, when Paul says having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles in that particular culture of that day, from the Jewish mindset, the Gentiles were the unbelievers. Most of them worshipped idols. And he says, even among them, have your conduct honorable among them, that when they speak against you, when they criticize you, when they make fun of you, when they belittle you, when they challenge you as evildoers, thinking you, you're, you're doing wrong, they may, by your good works, your consistent godly lifestyle, they'll observe that and ultimately glorify God because of your dedication and commitment on a consistent basis. Our example can influence unbelievers to glorify God. In Romans chapter 15, beginning with verse 9, and that the Gentiles, again the unbelievers, might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. You know, if you had one chance to teach one person and somehow somebody said, okay, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a choice. There are going to be 25 people lined up here. Teach one person the truth. And all, a whole bunch of these folks, most of them are from all kinds of denominations that teach error of one kind or another to one degree or another. But now this one over here, he's, he's, he's an unbeliever. He's, he's an agnostic. He's never become a Christian. Which one would you pull out of line? You might want to think about pulling that agnostic or that unbeliever or the one who simply shows no indication of faith in God because you can quickly show him the error of his way by logical and rational reasoning as well as through the scriptures, through the prophecies and then their fulfillment over and over and over again. And so even the Gentiles, even the unbelievers, through our influence on a continual basis, a consistent basis around them, not lauding our behavior, but, but just glorifying God by our consistent, faithful dedication to him and obedience to his teachings, they can come to believe in God. They can come to glorify God. They can see a difference in our life. We should not fit in with our culture, particularly now, like hand in glove. Now, we've got to live here in our land, but we should not look like what our, the, the ultimate portrait that our culture is, is painting right now because it's going off at breakneck speed in the devil's direction. So we ought to be visible, but not to draw attention to us for our self-praise, and glorification, but so that people can see there is a better way. There is a godly way. And they might want to start asking us, can you, can you tell me about that? Preacher, I know he, I suppose he's probably passed on now. He was way older than me a long, long time ago, and, and he, was, he, would, he would be somewhere in his 80s or 90s now, maybe 90s, I'm not sure. Probably 90s. So he may be passed on now. But I remember he told the story about how he came to Christ. And he said there was a co-worker who was a member of the Lord's church. And he would ask him questions. And he would ask him questions. And he would talk to him about the Bible. And that went on for how long do you think? Months, I think about 12 years. 
He just kept talking to him about God, about the Bible, about Christianity. And one evening, as he was sitting in a worship service, he got up and walked down the aisle and surrendered his life to Christ in baptism. You see, we can have the influence. It may take us months or years with some individuals, but we, through our conduct, through our example, we can actually influence some people to start thinking about their soul's salvation. Even in suffering and dying, because we don't see this as the end of the road. Even in suffering and dying, we look forward to a home in heaven and thereby we can glorify God. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, and Jesus is speaking to Peter here, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you were old, and so here he's prophesying the death that Peter was going to die, When you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And I believe, we understand, he was prophesying to Peter, you're going to be crucified one day yourself. You will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he, Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Interesting, isn't it? prophesying by what death, not just that Peter would die, but that Peter would glorify God even in his death. Interesting indeed. We need to not look for excuses to not glorify God. Trying to excuse ourselves for some kind of of ungodly activity or behavior on our part, or maybe simply to say, you know, I don't want to think about that. I just want to do this over here. Let's not forget. Let's not try to explain away our need to always glorify God. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13, the apostle Paul wrote, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. Now, if you read this particular context, Paul is talking there about when it comes to our worshiping God through giving. We need to not make excuses for not giving when God has blessed us with the ability to be able to give, even if it's just a little bit. But he says, even in this, in this, in, in this act, he says, they, other people, they will glorify God or they will see that you glorify God through your giving. And that's one basic way in worship that we bring glory to God or glorify him, thanking him for blessing us to be able to do this because of the material blessings that he's bestowed upon us. So we need to stop and think about that and not make excuses for for not doing what we should be doing to God's glory. But that's just one example. We need to be careful to not forget to glorify God for his blessings. Were there not any found who returned to glory, to to give glory to God except this foreigner? Luke 17 and verse 18. The setting here was Jesus had healed 10 men who were they, they were struggling with leprosy. Leprosy at that time was fairly common in that part of the world. And it was a dreaded disease. I believe even to this day there is no cure. Now we have learned how to try to steer clear of it a whole lot better than they knew then. Or at least practiced then. But these ten men, they were, they were afflicted with leprosy. Ultimately, their destiny was to die with leprosy. Peter mirac- Jesus miraculously healed them. As they were going on their way, they were healed all of a sudden. One turned back. 
to thank Jesus and glorify God. But just one. So one turned back to thank Jesus and glorify God. And so Jesus says, were there not found any who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And this was not even a Jew, apparently, who glorified God. Where are the nine? Where are the nine? They were healed also. We also need to be careful to not take God's glory, God's glory for ourselves. And I'm afraid a lot of times we find ourselves tempted to do that. I appreciate whenever I see some professional sports star who has just maybe performed some athletic feat that is, uh, you know, wonderful. He's really shown his ability. He's really done something great from a physical and athletic perspective. Some of them, I'm afraid, may kind of take the glory to themselves, but others, they will point up toward heaven, thanking God. I, I think that's, that's a good gesture on their part, recognizing God gave me this ability. Yes, I did this, but not in and of myself, by myself, on my own. I would not be able to have done that if God had not blessed me with the physical abilities with which he did. Never take God's glory for ourselves. And a stark example in this lesson, Acts 12 and verse 23, King Herod, he was making a speech before some people who wanted to impress him and wanted his benevolence. And they praised him, the voice of a God. And he received the glory. He did not correct them. He did not say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Not me. I'm just a man. He accepted that glory for himself. And so the scripture text tells us then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. Let's not take God's glory to ourselves. Ultimately, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, you were bought with a price. Therefore, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belong to God. How do we conduct ourselves physically? How do we carry ourselves physically? How do we take care of ourselves physically? Do we ignore some of the needs that we need to pay attention to in our physical well-being? And I'm not talking about overdoing it. But are, are we careless in the way that we, can, we, we take care of ourselves physically? Maybe overeating or undereating or abusing our physical body in some way or another through some habit or maybe just abusing it in different ways and not paying proper attention to our physical health, our physical stamina and so on. He says, you're bought at a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. The ability that God supplies. There have been many times in my life I have dreamed of being able to do things that I can't do. I could see it in my mind's eye doing some of those things, but I don't have the physical ability to do those things. But I did a long time ago zero in on some abilities God has blessed with me to be able to do and to do pretty well. And I'm thankful for those abilities and I want to serve him in those ways through those abilities and thereby give him glory. So if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. And you don't have to be a preacher or a classroom teacher to be able to use abilities that God has blessed you with to serve him and even to spread the gospel. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Can you glorify God? 
Can you glorify God as you take part in this particular action which you're contemplating? When you're faced with that decision, when you're faced with that temptation, and sometimes the devil can make it look really good, or maybe sometimes it's just out there and it's just kind of, of you know, We'd say, well, I don't know the devil's trying to tempt me in this, but here's a decision I have to make. I need to make. Should I take this? Should I take this? It's going to mean I'm going to have to move away to a different state, or or it means I'm going to have to change my job. How is that going to affect my life? How can I still be the Christian that I need to be? How can I still serve God in in making that decision? Which decision should I make? Ultimately, we need to ask ourselves, can I glorify God as I take part in this action, in the decision that I'm contemplating making? This evening, we need to ask ourselves, bottom line, have I glorified God by making the decision to come to him for forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ? Another soul added to the kingdom. Another precious individual adopted into God's family. Another precious soul added to the Lord's body. Have you made that decision? And in that way, come to God to his glory. If not, we'd love to help you. We'd love to assist you in being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins as you repent of your sins and confess your faith in him. If you need the prayers of the church, we're here. All you have to do is step forward and ask us or let us know privately if you need to study some more. We would love to study with you if you just ask. If you need to come, come right now as we stand together and sing.